All right, so we left off in Numbers chapter 20. We made it all the way to Numbers chapter 20 last week. So I know some of you are opening up your Bibles in your the great whoosh of pages. Yes, some of us just scroll. Um, it's amazing, scrolling's back in, in, in uh, scrolls are back in, in, in fad. But, um, all right, so the people um, of Israel have come to... Um, Kadesh Barnea, and in Kadesh Barnea, they were meant to enter into the promised land from the south and go into the land, and uh, they sent out 12 spies, and 10 of them said, we can't do it. They're, remember what, the, what they called them? Nephilim. Giants, burning ones, fallen ones, um, um, heroes of old. This is supposed to bring us back in our mind, supposed to bring us back to that um, Genesis chapter uh, 6. And so it's supposed to bring us back. These are unconquerable kind of people. And, um, and so they don't, and so they're... Cursed, you know, hey, you're going to have to wander in the desert till the next generation falls away. Um, and uh, so they're going to be in the desert, and only Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that said, hey, we can do this, we got God on our side, are going to be able to. And the people are upset, and they, uh, um, and you know, they rebel, and Korah's rebellion, remember that one? Land swallows up Korah's supporters and him and the families and the land. And um, When I read that, I like to think of that scene. From, you remember Lord of the Rings, right? That last scene in, in the Return of the King when the army's around him and that whole mountain opens up and just swallows the other army. It's a pretty cool scene. Um <laughs> But uh, that's the kind of thing I think about when I, when I hear that. Um, but we're in Numbers chapter 20. And the Israelite community uh, came to the desert of Zin on the first of the month. And the people stayed in uh, Kadesh. And Miriam died and was buried there. So one of Moses' greatest supporters and rivals at <laughs> different times, his sister is passing away. This is one of the first signs that that old generation is going to pass away. So we have Miriam pass away, one of the leaders. And once again, there's no water for the community. And they were gathered before Moses and Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brothers were dying before Yahweh. Why have you brought, us, brought the assembly of Yahweh us, our, our livestock, into the desert to die here. Why have you brought us from Egypt to bring us to this bad place? You know, I think about that, and I think about how much we do that in our lives, don't you think? I mean, things were better back then. <laughs> doesn't matter how much actually we're moving towards God's will and working in God's will, and things are actually better now, but they were always better back then. Uh, you know, you remember when? <laughs> I, I was always, you know, I missed the, the, the simpler generation. I was, of course, we forgot all the problems we had back then, too. <laughs> but we do this in our own lives all the time. <laughs> Life has not changed that much, has it? That's one of the reasons the Old Testament is so great. We, we relate with mirrors of identity. <laughs> they mirror our, our identity. Why have you brought us out? Is it not a... Uh, this, it, is, it is not a place for fi seeds or figs or vines or pomegranate trees. There is not water to drink. And Aaron, Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway 
of the tent of assembly, and they fell into the face, face, and the glory of Yahweh appeared to them. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and summon the community, you and Aaron, your brother, and speak to the rock. Before their eyes it will give up water and bring them out of the rock and let the community and their livestock drink. Now Moses has already done this once before. But remember before he strikes the rock and he was, God said, strike the rock. This time God says something much bigger. Speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. And that's a lot harder. And so Moses took the staff before Yahweh as he commanded him. And Moses there assembled the assembly. Please listen, you rebels. I love that wording. Please listen, you rebels. Can we bring water from you from this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and strikes the rock twice. And water does flow out. And the community and the livestock drink. But Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not trusted me to regard me as holy in the sight of Israel, you will not bring the assembled into the land that I had given to them. Those were the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with Yahweh and he showed himself holy among them. Um. <laughs> We're just going to let Cheryl read it for us. <laughs> We're in Numbers chapter 20. Thank you. You're welcome. No, that's fine. Um. So, um, people need water, and he strikes the rock. And this is a sin, not because God doesn't provide wa- water, but because he doesn't trust. And b- largely because he himself claims the credit this way. I mean, look at that, what he says. Um, Please listen, you rebels. Can we bring out water for, for you from this rock? It's not God will provide for you water from this rock. Can we provide water from this rock? And he strikes it. He's claiming the credit. And, um, and that will be the, the big sin that will keep him. Um, you also get the sense, and Deuteronomy brings out this sense um, there's this. There's a twofold sense of why Moses will not enter the the promised land because Deuteronomy focuses more on the second part um, as well. There's a sense that Moses also is the well, almost like a Jesus figure, the intercessor for the people, and and he's like taking on some of the responsibility of their sin upon himself, and. Um, so, but, but the Bible, very clear, this is why he did it. He took the credit for God and he, from God, and he's, um, and so he will not enter the promised land. And, um, and so, it, <laughs> I love this. As you read this, you know, we get the, the image of what happens later on, because we know in Deuteronomy, he looks over, he goes to the mountain, he's able to look over into the promised land. And says, that's the land. I, I can't go into it, but that's the land. But, and he could probably see this mountain from where he's at, but when Jesus comes and is transfigured, mm-hmm. Moses is there. So Jesus' life and his, his gift transforms and allows Moses to enter into the, 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 the land. For the first time. After when Jesus is the gift of Jesus that that covers all sin. Um, Wonderful imagery there. That um, David, you look like you have something to say. Well, I was thinking about Matthew 17, and you already said it, but Elijah's with him too. Elijah's with him too. Interesting enough, and Here's a thought, a what if. You know, the Bible talks about when Elijah and Moses both speak to God, glory shines upon them in the fire. When you read Matthew 17, Jesus is lit up, bright shining light. What if it was Jesus they were talking to? 
before it was in his before his fleshly. I think it was because well, I, that's what I think too. But well, there's proof of that, and uh, I believe it's Second Peter. Uh, there's there's a quote there that they actually were talking about Jesus coming back a second time. It, it was it was previews of coming attractions, so to speak. And I I don't remember exactly. It's in First or Second Peter, but it. That, that's the conversation that they had. Uh, it's a little bit more detailed than you get in Matthew 17. Yeah, um, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, and I love Jesus' imagery because we get, of course, we get the benefit of the doubt. We get the benefit of looking back from seeing Jesus into this. Um, Moses, can you imagine the heartbreak? He's been leading these people. They're, they're making him angry. He's frustrated. He's a frustrated leader. He's been really good. He's the humble guy. I mean, the Bible just said he right before he's the humblest guy in the Korah's rebellion. Remember, right before this, they're talking about how he was the humblest man on earth, and here he claims it with himself. He's frustrated. He claims it for himself, and this out of his frustration, and he's no longer the humble guy. And just this, and and it's like, man, how much one sin. Of course, you know, he wasn't the only, that wasn't his only sin, but that was the sin. And how much one sin can really just mess up our lives? Well, there might be a little bit more to that because there's a theory that when he said strike the rock, that was also acting out prophecy. Because when you strike the rock, it was representative of the Messiah being stricken on the cross. And then he wasn't supposed to strike the rock. Again, he was supposed to speak to the rock. He was supposed to speak to the rock. So it's like being crucified twice. So he misrepresented God before the people. Yeah, we could go that route. And I, I have read that theory. I just don't know. I mean, that, that might be truth in that. Um, I have not seen enough evidence for me to really a, a, adopt that theory yet. But um, uh, I'm open to it. Just not there yet um, but um, from Kadesh Moses sent out messengers to Edom Edom um, is their relatives actually they're from um, Esau this is your brother Israel has said you will know the hardship that has found us our ancestors went down to Egypt, and they went a long time ago and cries out, and look, we are in Kadesh, in the edge of your territory. Please let us go through your land, and we will go through the. We will not. We will. We will not go through a field or a vineyard, and we will not drink water from a well, and we will go from the road of the king. We will not turn aside left or right until we go through the territory. Then Edom says, "You shall not pass through. Let us, lest we will go out and meet you with the sword." So they're just saying, hey, let us pass through. Let's go. We're not going to attack you. We just want to go through. And they said, no, you can't. Which, to the Edomites' defense, there's an army wanting to walk through your land. If you say, sure, go ahead, well, what if they, you know, don't keep their promise? Then you've got this army in your land. Um, But not letting the Israelites go through will actually lead to their destruction because the Israelites will go through <laughs> one way or the other. And uh, um, I want to read this last little part and then and they sent out from Kadesh, Israel, the whole community, came to Mount Hor. And it, it, Yahweh said to Moses and to Aaron on Mount Hor, on the boundary of the land of Edom, saying, Let Aaron be gathered to his people. He will not come into the land that I have given to the Israelites, because you rebelled against my word at the waters of Mirbah. Take Aaron and Eliezer, his son, take them to Mount Hor, strip off Aaron's garments and put, Eliezer, put them on Eliezer, his son. Aaron will be gathered to his people and he will die there. So Moses did just as Yahweh commanded and he went up from Mount 
Hor before the eyes of all the community. And Moses stripped off Aaron's garments and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron died up on the mount, top of the mountain. And Moses and Eleazar went down from the mountain. All the community saw that Aaron died. So the house of Israel wept for, for Aaron for 30 days. So Aaron dies too. So in this chapter, we've had both Miriam and Aaron die. These are two of Moses' top supporters. And, um, and both of them die here. Even though these are two. And Moses, God, they sinned against God. They sinned against Moses. And he intercessed on both of this half. And now they're both dying. Um, which is probably about time, but uh, it still must have been a difficult uh, experience for them. All right, um, Numbers chapter 21. Now, there's a lot we can say about this chapter, but uh, we're going to keep it to 15 minutes. <laughs> no. Um, um, Okay, uh, verse 4. They set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden, but the people came impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us to Egypt to die in the desert? There's no food and water. Our hearts detest this miserable food. Man, this is getting like an old record, isn't it? <laughs> like, didn't we just read this? <laughs> um. And Yahweh sent among the people poisonous snakes. Um, interesting enough, in this in this area here, there's these uh, copper brown snakes that hide in the in the in the sand, and will bite people. And these snakes are known to have a, a very uh, uh, burning poison, and they call them burning one. Um, and um, And, um, and, you know, we have sinned, and the people recognize, hey, we've sinned against Yahweh and prayed and against you. Pray to Yahweh and let him remove. So Moses, once again, is the intercessor. And so he prays for the people. This is Moses' full-on priest mode, right? And Yahweh said to Moses, make yourself a, a snake and place them on a pole. When anyone who's bitten and looks at the person will live. So Moses made a snake of bronze, and he placed, the, placed it on the pole. Whenever a, per, a snake became, bit someone, that person looked at the snake of bronze, and he lived. Hmm, better than any antipoison we have today. Um, the Nehushtan is this bronze um, serpent on a pole. Um, it's um, when we think of the serpent that we've already seen in the scriptures we're supposed to think back to that Genesis moment I mean, it's supposed to bring back that mindset. The serpent being up on a pole, um, being crushed by the, the, the foot of man. Uh, you know, this, is, this imagery is still beyond there. Um, snakes in other mythologies are often seen as healing uh, um, symbols including Egypt, where they just left from. And um, if you look even up here, I, there's two on this picture I got from the Internet. Um, there are more than this, but like mm, Caduceus, the staff of Mercury, is the messenger god, and uh, the god of healing. Um, but there are others as well. Um, the In... Um, uh, Roman mythology, um, the, one of the symbols uh, of a doctor was, actually we still have them today on our, a lot of our ambulances have um, 
the symbol, yeah, it comes from Roman mythology, one of the gods uh, uh, the, the, of Pythias, uh, of Python, the, the, uh, was a healing god. Um, a lot of uh, ancient religions ha used the snake as a, a symbol of regeneration because it sheds its skin, becomes new again. And uh, it's often seen as a, a healing symbol. But... Um, So, well, we're, um, so, yeah, so we have this imagery of the healing in the, the serpent, but um, on this bronze, now bronze is a special, uh, uh, a special metal. It's one of the few things that, um, oh, you put it very well, David. How, how did you put it last week? I remember how you put it. Well, bronze Levitically is able to withstand the heat. Thank you, is the heat. And the heat is, is uh, associated with fire of judgment. Mm -hmm. So it is a picture of sin. The serpent equals sin or Satan is a picture of sin being judged on this bronze standard, which can withstand the fires of judgment, which stands for Jesus because he took on our judgment. Now, when it originally comes out in the... Book of um, in, in the book of um, of Numbers, they have no idea about Jesus yet. <laughs> so, um, so we see a lot more. We're told a lot more in the New Testament about the new hashtag and the hashtag and what it symbolizes. But they just saw it as, hey, it's going to save us from all these burning snakes. Um, I, there's a few verses on here. Um, there are more verses in the New Testament, but here's two uh, of the special ones. Uh, John 3, 14. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, and even so um, must the Son of Man be lifted up. The same imagery ties John. Is, John, who's a student of the Old Testament, sees the correlation between the bronze, the serpent, the withstanding of judgment, but also the being lifted up for providing healing. For our sin being, being healed as we look upon the cross and the one who dies upon the cross and, and lift it up. And there's a faith matter here that they have to look at it in faith. To me, that's yes, that's absolutely right. They have to look upon it in faith. Um uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him, he, him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we see Christ, we know Christ, the New, Old, New Testament believers knew Christ was this image. And they were, they made the correlation and we should too. Uh, David? Uh, I think it's really helpful to understand. It's not just John. John's writing down Jesus' words. Jesus said this, so he's, Jesus actually cleans this up for us. Yeah, you know, he, absolutely. He, pro he provides the authenticity, and he's the one that does a correlation. I mean, John has a part in it, but these are Jesus' words. Um, absolutely. Um, by when I said Jesus, John, because John had to make the choice, I mean, Jesus says, John even himself says he does and says so much more that we can't write it all down. Um, so John made the correlation. Jo jo John had to say, well, this is important. We need to write this one down. Um, but, and there's, there's other passages we could turn to about the New Testament, about the New Nehashtan. Um, unfortunately, this is a study that we could spend the entire uh, you know, 16 weeks on just the Nehashtan, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, this is a, this is one of those imageries that we will that that will come up again. Um, I do want to point out that in Second Kings 18, um, four, he removed the high places and he smashed the stone pillars. He cut down 
the poles of Asherah worship, and he demolished the bronze serpent that Moses had made in the days of Israel. Um, by the time of King Hezekiah, which is the king that they're talking about in this passage, um, it's become an idol. And I, I, I think we need to take, I mean, this is a warning for us. Even good things, like the Nehushtan, the symbol of God on the cross and, and a saving grace and mercy, even these can be idols. Uh, we got to be careful with even like images of Jesus, because those are just images. They're not Jesus. They can become, you know, when we start taking, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, and, and there, there's, there's even things uh, we worship the Bible instead of the person the Bible talks about. I mean, that can even be a cha- a danger that I've seen people do. And it's it's well, how can that be? But you you start but but if you you explore, some people have begun to worship things that are wonderful, but they're not God. And this is a wonderful example of how a warning for us that that even great things, and then my personal belief why the ark disappears, um, because they start to worship it instead of. Um, and put it ahead of, you know, well, you know, and we'll see this when we talk about uh, later on when we talk about the, the history of the Ark um, around King David's time. Um, you know, they're just putting it out there as like it's some magic weapon that's going to, you know, and not, hey, God is here. Um, otherwise, them, them priests would never be acting like them priests do. Uh, <laughs> um and, uh, and so I, I really think that has something to do with it. And that's probably not all of the reason why the ark disappears, but that, I think that really has something to do with it. Um, but uh, and it's definitely a warning for us that we cannot be caught up in these images. Uh, we have to worship the true God. Um, uh, one book I recommend when when re- thinking about God is Knowing God by uh, Packard. And it's a wonderful book that uh, I have on my shelf that uh, um, just talks about, you know, even our, even though we sometimes we mean to worship the true God, we can form false images out of our lack of understanding and, and knowledge of, of what God is. And, uh, and so it's, uh, and that's just one of the things we need to watch ourselves on. And we saw this kind of behavior. Remember when that Da Vinci Code came out? Yeah. I remember, you remember the craze? They were, they were taking, and we have, uh, I don't know, I guess someone donated this picture to the church uh, many moons ago. Yeah. Um, this, this is uh, the Last Supper by Da Vinci, and they took this and they started this is instead of, instead of listening to what the scriptures say, instead of what Jesus says, they were taking this as the making, the, and that's an idol. That that became an idol. Uh, now the picture is a wonderful picture if we keep it in its right place, but it could become a danger. This was good for a time, and then it expired. It expired, and they should have right. got rid of it. Um, and and that's another thing we need to remember: is all things are good for a time. We hang on to things, right? Yeah. <laughs> How long do we? And things are good for time. And sometimes we have to get rid of them. Um, and there's always a challenge when we switch to different, and thank you, David, when we switch to uh, different uh, modes of worship even. Um, well, that's not biblical. Well, actually, does the Bible, you know, sometimes it's just a shift of this was good and we, you know, and now it's time to switch and and programs. Oh, how many times do churches hang on to programs instead of what the pro? We forget why we have the program in the first place. And you know, like like Sunday nights, right? It originally was a time to bring your non-Christian friends, yeah. and a lot of churches are going away with it because the non-Christian friends don't come Sunday nights because of you know Sunday night football. So they're switching to another night, you know. Um, but it lost its per. But people are like, no, we can't get rid of Sunday night because. You know, the three of us that are here were, you know. <laughs> um, 
and uh, you know, and, and and this is something that you know, and and there's a lot we can say about that. There's there's a lot to be read here, in just this this little idea. Um, wonderful. The Nehushtan is one of my favorite subjects in in the Book of Numbers. Um, like I said, we got we don't have enough time to cover uh, all that that can just wrap your wrap around the Nehushtan and the themes that we could shoot off of it. Um, let's go back. Uh, after Kadesh Barnea, the Israelites will travel to the, um, the, the plain of Moab. Now, on this map right here, that's the reddish area down here. And um, this map lays out several different ways they can take to get there and, and, and follow, still following the scripture-based because the truth, we just don't have a clue. <laughs> uh, I mean, realistically speaking, they're wandering in the desert. You know, which way did God lead them through the desert? And it gives us some clues, you know, like they hit up certain towns. And, of course, some of those towns, we don't know where they are. Uh, some of them, we do know where they are. Um, and, uh, and they're going, but they're moving from the plains of Moab into land of Edom, and they're going to be heading up to the area where they're going to cross into the... Uh, eventually, they will be making their way up uh, to Shittim, where they will cross into... That's where they're going to have their staging area to cross into... I mean, where Jericho is, which is right across from that, on the Jordan River, across the, the river. Um, and, uh, but while they're wandering around and, and they're um, in Moab, um, Balak. Balak, he's a Moabite king, and um, he saw what the Israelites did to the Amorites and the Moabites, and he he will be, uh, and they're going across there, and and Balak will be one of these kings that uh, one of those, you know, of course, when we say king, sometimes we think like these big rulers, but, you know, in this kind of area, this like, you know, king's there's big kings, little kings, and correlations of kings, and and uh, they rule over areas and provinces, and and um, and um, Balak, um, son of Zippor, king of Moab at the time, sends messengers to Balaam. Now, Balaam is one of my personal favorite characters in the book of Numbers. Balaam is um, a um, a Mesopotamian holy man, and you can actually find writings about Balaam in non-biblical sources, uh, which is actually kind of rare for this time period because a lot of stuff you know like we know about certain things because of the Bible. Um, and so some people say, well, you know, there's no proof in that because just because it's the Bible, you know. But, um, but Balaam is written in non-biblical writings. He's a character that is in there. Um, he is a seer of the gods. And he's very famous. And Balak will send for Balaam. And now Balaam, when he finds Balaam, Balaam's up on a high place, a worship place. One of the things they used to do, see, we, we've, we've lost a lot of this, and the imagery is throughout the scriptures of, um, of worshiping God on the mountaintop. And in this, uh, high places, mountaintops, are often where they worshiped gods. They felt like you could get closer to God. Um, I even think uh, the most classic one we see in, uh, outside of the Bible is like Mount Olympus, right? Uh, where the gods reside in the Greek mythology. Um, but he's on, they go to the, the high places, 
And these are places where they can worship God, uh, their gods, even gods. And uh, there's lots of these different worship sites. And some of them are multiple gods can be worshipped on one site. Um, um, Baal um, will be one of the big ones that Balaam will worship. Baal will mean Lord in the Canaanite mythology, but he's the god of the storm and therefore fertility and, and life. And I'll talk about him a little later, maybe. Um, he's kind of a fun character. Maybe I'll skip him. I don't know. I don't know if you guys need to know about Baal and Mott and the you get you ugaritic um, mythologies. Um, if you're interested in that, there's the ugaritic mythologies um, that we found uh, from, and then they have like the Canaanite structure of the the fertility land and involves you know death and sex and. You know, all those wonderful things and dismemberment and all those things we see. And, and, um, I think it's interesting too, the fact that he talks about a lot, a lot of specter literature comes about this. And that's to prove that this is historical evidence. This, the, yeah, there is, there is, there is historical evidence that, that this is, you know, you know, we're not just making this up. And, and, uh, the more people dig into it, the more they find the Bible does. Um, even the most, like, non-biblical people, like, no, the Bible, you know, from the time of King David, they can't deny it. Now, they might make an argument before King David, but from King David on, there's no denying it at all. And that's the most secular, I hate the Bible kind of people. They just don't, you know, um, and, um, you know, you just can't make that argument. And as we look into the scriptures, you can see them more and more. And uh, so, uh, absolutely, Balaam will be in there. Um, so Balaam will ride his donkey um, to the king Balak, and uh, he's wanting Balak's wanting to to speak to the gods and and tell him, "Hey, is the Israelites going to destroy me? Or can I? What can I do to defeat them?" And the donkey sees an angel or a messenger of God and, uh, and turns away into the field. Now Balaam doesn't see the angel and he turns the donkey back into the path and strikes the donkey. And, um, then they'll continue on the path and another, the angel appears once again and, uh, you know, and uh, the donkey, um, this time they're, in between a vineyard and a wall and you know the donkey smashes his foot trying to get away from the angel and um, and then finally another angel comes down and, and then he beats the donkey back into submission and the, the third time the donkey just lays down um, and uh, the Balaam uh, open I, I like this uh, the Lord opens the mouth of the donkey wouldn't that be trippy? <laughs> Got out to Oatman, you're, you know, you're out there in Oatman, and a donkey starts talking to you. <laughs> um, um, and that will get, uh, you know, but one thing that I like about this is this is the famous seer of the gods not listening to God. <laughs> Probably because he doesn't want to, you know. There's a lot of money in this kind of business uh, for people that can actually provide um, insight into what the will of the gods were, and and whether you believe in the other gods or not, there they did, and there was a lot of money to be made by that. And if you could give a favorable prophecy, or even sway armies. There was a lot of money they made in that. And Balaam made a living off of this. And, um, but anyways, the, when the, ma the donkey opens his mouth, that kind of gets his attention. And the angel of the Lord appears and reminds Balaam that you're the famous sea of the gods. You can only say what 
Yahweh, what God has told you to say. Not to be a yes man, basically. And we see prophets on both, and every, you know, if you're getting your advice from a prophet, you know, court prophets often become yes men. We'll see that in, in the Israelite, they, be, they had to do that a lot too. Um, um, by the time of Isaiah, he, you know, Micah is really hard on the, <laughs> the court prophets. Um, you know, those, all the, you know, they're just, they're just yes men. Whatever you want, Lord. And they're talking about the king, not the God. Uh, don't be, and, but he's, this angel says, don't be a yes man. And he tells the king, and so when he meets with the king, he tells the king that God will bless the Israelites and curse the Moabites. Um, and that will, um, and eventually the Moabites will fall to the Israelites. Um, where are we at? Numbers 25. I think that's where we're at. Pastor? Yes. There is a, uh, a scripture in Second Peter that directly affects, talks about Balaam and his, mm-hmm, there is. what he did, stains and blemishes, and uh, he received a, buke, a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey speaking with the voice of a man restrained the madness of the, pop, of the prophet. And that's Second Peter two, uh, verse sixteen. So it goes. It's yeah. Um, yeah, he goes go full circle there. You know, the uh, Second Peter uh, makes reference to this as well. Um, um, when Israel dev- dwelled in Shittim, which if you want to look on this map is up um, top there, the top one in there on this map, and um, they are invited. They invite the people to sacrifice of their gods, and the people ate and worshipped their gods. So Israel joined together at Baal Peor, which is. Um, a mountain of Baal, the uh, false, uh, a um, Mesopotamian god, a high place of their god. And Yahweh became angry with Israel. Um, false worship is going to be something that plagues us today. Them, then, and us today. It's something that, we, that uh, is just um, such a challenge as Satan will use this tool of worshiping. And... Um, and the Israelites will be very swayable. We want to be just like everyone else. Now, here in the United States, we've, we've had a reprieve because so many of us are Christian that our laws tend to match up with Christianity. So it's been, quote, easy to be a Christian. As the United States become less and less as those numbers drop, it's going to become harder. And uh, we're, we're, but it's going to be harder. It's even going to be harder, and we're going to see that um, that our once again our, we're going to face the challenge of we have to be different. But our temptation will be just like them to say, "I want to be like just like them," and that's going to be a, t- a temptation. Um, and we already see that in churches where they say, I want to be just like everyone else. And, and we have false worship in churches. But um, Yahweh said to Moses, take all the leaders, all the people, and kill them before the sun. So fierce the anger of God will turn to Israel. So Moses said to the judge of Israel, each of you kill his men who are joined together with Baal Peor. And behold, a man from Israel came and brought to his brothers a Midianite woman before the, the eyes of Moses and before all the eyes of the community of Israel. And they were weeping at the door of the tent of the, uh, at the assembly. Interesting enough, the Moabites tried to defeat them with army. Edomites, they fall, they fall, they fall. But then you introduce the worship practices. 
and apparently this, especially this one of sacred prostitution, and it brings them to their knees. The Israelites to their knees. This false worship. They're strong, but they're not able to wear the. Um, but they're struggling with this uh, prostitution. And um, uh, Peor, which was known for their fertility gods, and and um, worship there often included sex. Um, it's kind of weird for us when in our you know <laughs> we we tend to away from sex, you know, it talk in public, especially in church. But uh, in many religions, and especially in the Canaanite religion, sex was part of the worship, and you would have sex right there in the temple. Um, or take them, you would buy the, in one case, you would buy the, the woman in the temple and take her outside the temple to have sex. Sometimes in a room, but often just right outside. Um, these things are uh, were part of the the worship practices, and it's like for it seems so strange to us, but this was normal, and uh, so when they um, when these these prostitutes come, uh, it begins to work their way into just once again we want to be like everyone else, um, and. Um, and they begin to practice these things even in the tabernacle. And we see here, they're, they're trying to practice. The, and they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of the siblings. When Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, so Aaron's grandson, he got up from the midst of the community and took a spear in his hand. And he went to the man of Israel into the woman's section of the tent. And he drove the two, the two of them, a man of Israel and the woman, into her belly and the plague of Israel stopped. So they were receiving this plague. They, yeah, he, he, he was, he was, well, he didn't, he, he <laughs> okay, so what happened is a plague became upon them, probably a venereal disease because they're practicing um, sexual practice with these prostitutes and it was going around and it even began, they were in the tabernacle and the high priest at this time, Aaron's grandson, grabs a spear, and they're in the, the area of the tabernacle, and he takes a spear, and he drives it through a man and into the woman and kills them both. And this sacrifice of, we will not bring this into our worship space. You will not, this is not okay. And this will stop the disease. And there were 24,000 that died at this there's 24,000 that died because of this, this plague. Um, including Balaam, the seer of the gods, will die um, with this plague. I think what you're talking to about as far as us today, the church today, we live in the age of apostasy where the world and the church want to go hand in hand. And the Bible says, be ye separate. The Bible does say be separate, and, and we do tend to, we, we live in, and I don't know if it's just today, it's been like that. If you read church history, it's kind of the, always been the struggle, is we want to be hand in hand with everyone else when the Bible clearly says, don't be like everybody else. And every generation we have the same struggle, even though it looks different. You know, how do we stay different? And true to God's word, when the call of this is so, Lene, take a stand. Take a stand. Not have to apply to the other side and vice versa. 
uh, separation of church and state was, well, the primary reason for that was because they didn't want the church controlling the state and vice versa, the state controlling the church like they did in England and several other countries as well. But it was primarily in England. They were, they were one, we don't want the two being the same. The state cannot control what we worship, and the church cannot control our, um, but. Um, but you just said it right there. The state can't control what we worship, and the, the church has to control the state, but can't be the same. But the temptation will always be to be just like everyone else. I mean, look at the churches we see around, around, I mean, read the news. Churches that don't align with the social norm will be ostracized, put down, and ridiculed. Even, even what, well, be, you know, no matter what, way before, you know, founding fathers and before. Um, but the social norm will always dictate how we feel like, and churches that fall into the social norm are praised. And, well, of course, the Bible says this, even though it doesn't say that. Uh, <laughs> Um, but we can make the Bible say anything we want, right? And so, but there will always be the challenge. It was a challenge for Moses' group. It was why they have a king later on. Um, it's the same challenge we're going to, we face today, and it will be the same challenge our, our, the next generation will face. We must remain true to the scriptures, even if it calls us to be different. And then like when we will read about the prophets, the nations had become just like everyone else. And so, no wonder God's destroying them. And uh, and of course, you know, the United States. If we, I mean, it's very clear that if we don't stay true to God's word and of course, we probably won't. I mean, that's just reality. Then, at some point, Jesus is coming back. <laughs> or we could fall. <laughs> we could fly, or we could fall, one way or the other. Uh, but the, anyway, the, the the faithful remnant will remain. Um, of course, nowhere in the Bible is the United States mentioned. Um, I've heard people try to make the United States into the scriptures, and you're really reaching when you start doing that. Um, so I don't think we, we, we can apply the teachings to the United States, but we can't apply that we are what's in the scriptures, because it's not there. But we can apply the teachings, and the, the teaching is very clear, that if those who follow God's will will prosper... May even though the person may not prosper, the nation will prosper. But those who and those who don't, the nation will fall. And of course, a lot of us in the United States, as we see the nation going down, we're like, "Well, just take us now. <laughs> let's let's have that because we don't want our nation to fall. We don't want to be part of that." Um, in, in many ways, it's the easier way out. And will God allow that to be the, the way we get to take? Well, maybe. And maybe not. You know, the bottom line is that the true remnant are those who stay true to the word of God. That's right. The, 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 the faithful remnant will remain. And those will be the ones that stay true to God. And we will have to be one of those. No matter what. It leads to. Um, all right. Well, we got four minutes. I'd like to finish some of this up. Um, okay. So, um, 
at the end, um, towards the end of Numbers, at the end of the 38 years, it comes to a close, the three tribes request to stay in the land Transjordan. They will, they, they'll have to um, still take the Canaanite land, the promised land, but they will be able to get their land on the Transjordan, Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Um, numbers 35, I'm going to go fast because I want to finish Numbers. We're going to go to Deuteronomy next week. No, not next week, but the week after. Um, we will establish um, Levitical cities. There are 48 Levitical cities. These are cities that are the priestly cities. Divided according to the tribes, they will be the place. Um, the the Levites will 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 control, and this will be a place of worship. If you can't make it to the main tabernacle, because uh, you know, realistically speaking, you can't make it to you know what will eventually be in Jerusalem. That's by the time of Jesus, but it, uh, right now it, it'll be. Uh, you can't travel wherever the tabernacle lies every week. You know, the land's too big for that. You know, we're on foot here. <laughs> so they have 48 Levitical cities where you can go and worship. Um, and then there are certain high times where you're supposed to make it to the, the main worship site. And uh, there will be six re- cities of refuge. Now these are not like what we talk about cities of refuge today, like, you know, where the laws don't apply. These are the cities where if you kill someone on accident, accident, see, before they didn't have a a a police system. So if someone dies, it is the responsibility of the family to get retribution. And the law was, well, before, uh, you know, we go back into Genesis, we saw that it was escalation. You know, you kill one of mine, I'm going to kill two of yours. Uh, but then the Bible lays down an eye for an eye kind of thing, so make the, the, the punishment just, equal. And, um, and so, but you could go to one of these six cities and uh, you were not, you, they were not allowed to kill you. And a lot of times they would even take you to these cities so the judges, the, the priest could act as like we would call judges, not in the judges of the Bible sense, but in the judges as like our court system today, so they could lay down a verdict and tell what, what would make it equal. You know, how much to pay, this person was it was an accident, was it not an accident, all these things, and they would use God's will, and they would do these co- often casting of lots, and um, which is kind of like tossing of uh, dice. Um, and, uh, and, and different things. Um, but you, you could go in fear, or you could go, if you didn't really want to kill someone, you could let them or take them to one of these cities so they'll be tried. Um, so these were like the court cities, is really what it was. Um, now, anything lesser than murder, just, you know, the local district was supposed to handle these things. Um, you know, uh, you know, if, you know, you lose property, well, and obviously you, you know, pay for the property. But uh, um, there are these things, and, and Levitical cities, and... Um, was, it, was this God's generational justice? I think this was the way that they, I think God laid this out for them for the sake of justice um, and his mercy, um, now we could talk about um, the Levites and their their role as priests, the intercessors between God and determining God's will. And uh, we can talk about how Jesus, the ultimate priest, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> um, there are some things we could talk about this, um, um, but um, these Levitical cities will kind of fade away as. Um, the court systems and, and, and other justice systems come into bigger play as the king takes over and, and that kind of stuff happens. But uh, that'll be generations down the line. Um, during the sense of the judges, they don't have 
any of this. Uh, this will be like how they... Now, interesting enough, as he's laying down these cities, uh, this is something important to remember. The limited cities, the cities of refuge, they haven't actually taken the land yet. <laughs> he's given it to them. It's like, this is going to be... They haven't taken the land yet. This is before the book of Joshua where they take the land. Um, so that is something in that. Um, all right, it is 7.02. Um, what do we have? Uh, do we have anything else we want to say on this? I do. Um, you know, as we study this and all the fighting and stuff, this is when there was law, and now we have grace, and that is the real big distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because now we don't recognize flesh and blood. Well, there is law, a difference between law and grace in the Old Testament and the New Testament, but at the same time, grace was the primary factor in the Old Testament as well. Uh, grace was, yes, they had uh, the law and there was this sense of blood sacrifice that they didn't have to, that we don't have to follow because of God's uh, ultimate sacrifice, but grace was the primary feature in the Old Testament as well. Uh, we tend to overlook the grace because we often don't know how to read the Old Testament. But the grace was the primary feature of the Old Testament as well. In the Old Testament, there it seemed like there was times when God told, told them to wipe everybody out. And now there's everybody. Yes, God does tell them to wipe everything out, everyone out at different times. And some of that is hyperbole. Um, and some of that is literal. And um, some of that is because they have to take the land. And you can't have false worship in a land that's supposed to be pure. And some of that, but I mean, they don't follow through with that. We'll read the scriptures and they don't follow through with most of it. Um, um, but even in that, there's God's grace. Um, as we read why the Mesopotamians were destroyed, a lot of it was for the sake of grace. And of course, if you take the, the, the uh, Genesis 6 as being, uh, and there's, some, there's some things about uh, Genesis 6 being um, the uh, sons of God are actually uh, heavenly hosts, they're angels. Um, if you take it that way, and you don't have to take it that way, when we, remember we talked about the two different ways you can take it, then the destruction of the land can actually be to get rid of these, this false line that is, that has sprouted out, and there's, uh, and that can change. And if you, of course, if you, I mean, just, that's why I said just six so important, because which way you read it, can really have an effect on even like Judges, and Joshua, how you, well, why this is happening and stuff like that, and, uh, but. Um, all right, let's talk about numbers next week. Um, no, not numbers, sorry, Deuteronomy next week. I'm probably going to, not next week, sorry. Next week, we're having a break. We're doing the praise and worship night. That's praise and worship night. Please come. We're going to have singing and just relaxing and worshiping God and, and take a break from the heavy thinking and just let God's spirit flow in and around us and, and worship of him um, and then when we come back the week after we're going to cover Deuteronomy in one week I think um, and not that Deuteronomy isn't fascinating I've been in Deuteronomy this is my fourth month in the book of Deuteronomy and it's so enthralling and but we've already covered the general introductory stuff so we're going to talk about just kind of the themes and 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 how to read it, and you guys can read it, <laughs> and then we'll uh, we'll do that, and um, and then we'll move on to the Deuteromistic history. All right, uh, let's close in prayer. Would anyone like to close us in prayer? All right, thank you. <laughs>